。我们下一位是来自德国的朋友，是 Adrian Gro， 嗯，他是 Open Knowledge Foundation 啊、uh, 的一个 director， 他负他们负责的就是呃，他等一下要讲的一个呃呃。呃、uh, ，funding， 呃、uh, ，有点像是我们的那个奖助金的这样的一个 project， 不过他们的奖助金的来源是政府。好，那所以他今天等下谈的一个他的题目会是去讨论，就是 civic tech 跟 public funding 这里面是不是有一些文化冲突的问题。那再再再跟大家说一下，就是如果有人比较晚进来的话，因为。呃，我们这边进进行方式是每个讲者讲二十分钟，最后我们才有讨论的时间。所以如果你你有一些问题想要问黄浩华，但是刚刚没有讨论的机会，那现在你可以去 Slido， 然后用那个号码是 R 8 1 2把你的问题写下来。好，那我们最后在呃，就是呃，最后那三十分钟的时候会一起讨论。Um, okay, so without further ado, I'll give you the floor. Thank, Thank you. you. Is that on? Yeah. Hi. Um, Thanks for having me. My name is Adriana. I'm based in Berlin, um, working for the Prototype Fund, which is a program by the Open Knowledge Foundation and the German Federal Ministry for Education and Research. So how does that work? An NGO and the Federal Ministry setting up a grant together for civic hackers, who are a group of people who are usually not really working together with government in Germany and who are not used to receiving public money for the work they do. Um, we established the Prototype Fund in 2016, so um, we are on our fifth round now. It just closed. And so I can share a couple of learnings and insights um, we have from the previous rounds and also present you the key facts and figures from our first in-depth report um, from the very first round we had with the Prototype Fund. So what I will do is just give you a quick intro to what is the Prototype Fund, um, why did we set it up, why is the Federal Ministry for Education and Research doing that, why are we doing that, and then share the key learnings and show you some facts and figures. And I try to speed up a little because I think we are totally out of the schedule, so I'll, I'll, I'll be fast. So the prototype fund. Um, the federal ministry provides about 8 million euros until 2021, and every six months um, programmers can apply for funding. If they get accepted, we have a jury who's um, selecting the, the winning pro projects, then they get about 50,000 euros, that's the maximum amount they can get for um, writing code for six months. Um, we only select projects that work in the field of civic tech, data literacy, infrastructure or security. And we do not necessarily want projects to have a business model. They can, but they shouldn't be primarily driven um, yeah, by making profit. They should write open source software that benefits society, that is for the social good. Um, this is a real new thing for Germany. Usually the government hands out money to think tanks, big companies, universities or startups. It never handed out money before to individuals. So we kind of hacked the funding system in Germany and they really changed it after the prototype fund now made it a law that it's possible that you as an individual can apply for public money and that wasn't possible before and the prototype fund um, changed that. So, so far we um, spent 2.1 million euro and funded 62 projects. Um, yeah, and that is the 47,500 is the exact number. I always say 50,000, so it's a, yeah. Um, let me give you a few examples who we fund. There is the Syrian archive for, um, uh, for the first round and the second round, we funded them. They do amazing work. Uh, they reg recognize that many people in Syria uploaded um, videos from their phones where they recorded explosions, injuries, um, all sorts of things. And of course, platforms like YouTube took those videos down because the content was really violent. Um, but then again, you need those videos to maybe one day bring people in front of a court and say, well, we can now with those videos show what happened there and um, maybe then 
prosecute some people. So what they do is uh, they build an archive where they store those videos so they don't get lost. And what they also did is um, using a software that is able to identify the content of those videos so that people don't have to watch 30,000 plus videos, which is a lot of work and there are not enough people who would want to do something like this. Because of course this is traumatizing. So by letting, it doing, um, letting a software do it, they can do it way faster and also they avoid um, the possibility of people being traumatized by that. Um, so, and also Scindict. Scindict is like a wiki for sign language. Um, I wasn't aware that there are dialects in sign language as well, so someone from the south of Germany might have problem talking to someone from the north of Germany because they use different signs for different words. And of course, in a global scale, this is even more complicated. So with Seindict, um, you can look up what is the word for pizza in one place, and then you r might realize, okay, I use a completely different, uh, I'm sorry, sign for pizza. And then you just um, switch on your front camera, do the sign for pizza, upload it, and so you get a knowledge base where people can um, understand how it differs, and also people who want to learn sign language can use the Seindict tool. So, um, the Prototype Fund is not just a fund that hands out money, it's also a research project. It means the government recognized that innovation does not only happen in big companies, it also happens when talented, creative people just sit down together and start doing things and they have good ideas and then they want to do, yeah, they want to, to, to create this new tool but you need to support them. So they want to learn how they can spend public money in a different way than they did before. And the Prototype Fund, therefore, is a prototype itself. It's the first program to spend public money in a way like it's never been done before in Germany. So what we do is we collect, um, we, we have interviews, we collect data, we regularly ask the people who we fund how it's going for them so that when the Prototype Fund ends, 2021, we have enough knowledge to maybe set up another fund or do it in a different way or have people who also in other countries um, set up a different program like the prototype fund. So that's also the reason why the government is interested in, um, in learning about the prototype fund and how to spend public money. So why culture clash? This is stereotypical, but it's also true. Um, German bureaucracy is largely based on paper trails. So for everything you sign a paper and you send in the paper or you have to go to um, some, some government body, some bureau somewhere personally to get a new identity card and so on and so forth. So for example, uh, one very large German city, it's called Frankfurt. That's the city where the second or third biggest airport of Europe is located they offer about 12 digital services to their citizens. So for everything else, you, you need to receive a letter, you need to go there, and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, German bureaucracy isn't particularly top of the game, but then again, you also have to see that bureaucratic systems, they way, the way to work for them is probably not, like the best way is probably not to be fast and break things or to disrupt processes and to be like just innovative for the sake of innovation because they handle a vast body of very sensitive data and a lot of people rely on their services. So how do you innovate or disrupt a running system that is as important as the bureaucratic system of uh, a large country? Um, so this is, it, it's a culture clash in a sense that for civic hackers, doing things is mostly that. You have an idea, you do user research, you try, you fail, you try again, you come up with something better. Doesn't really work for bureaucracy. But by bringing those two different systems together with the prototype fund, what we see is that a little bit of the hacker spirit is transmitted to German bureaucracy while bureaucracy is tapping into well, how are those people doing things? And they see 
I, I, I go to the next slide. Some people get go crazy sometimes. <laughs> um, and, and they see that multidisciplinary teams who, who work in a very hands-on mode, who have lots of like short but update meetings, who do lots of user research, that they come up with really hands-on and citizen-centered ideas. So the prototype fund does actually do three things. It funds people who invest their time and energy in doing good software for citizens. It teaches the government how to spend money in a different way. And it brings those two communities together and gives them an opportunity to learn from each other. So that's, I think that's a really nice thing. And of course there are risks. It's 50,000 euro for each project and 8 million overall is not a big amount of money for a government. But nevertheless, you don't know if you hand out money to an individual, will that individual really work on a project or will they just go on holiday? Um, so what we did is, okay, we take public money, we write public code. That means everything, the prototype funds, needs to be open source. So if something fails, if the project turns out to be a really bad idea, it, it really ma doesn't matter. It's not a problem. Then someone else can look at your code and see, okay, they failed maybe because of this and that. I have a similar idea, but now I know that I don't have to do it in this way, and then they can build on top of that. And in the end, this is benefiting the public. So, key learnings. We, um, as I said, had five rounds, and we see a couple of things coming up um, over and over again. So this is a learning for us and for the government. If you hand out money, make it easy to get. Easy to get in this case means um, all the projects that apply have to fill out an online form with eight questions. They send it in. If they get accepted, we do a whole one-day workshop where we just fill out papers. Because you have to fill out a lot of papers if you want to have money from the government. And all the things you have to fill out, the language is so complicated, I don't even understand it. And some people we fund are based in Germany, but they are not native Germans. So that it, it's so overly complicated. And that's one of the reasons why most individuals shy away from applying for public money, because you get this huge pile of paper that is really difficult. And um, let me not go into how the online portals look. It's, uh, it's a mess. But we see how much willingness is there from the government to, to understand that this might be complicated for individuals and then to reach out a hand. So actually for the workshop, there are government um, officials coming in, helping those projects to fill out the paper. And then they just get the money. They need to hand in um, like a worksheet every month. And in the end, they, we have a demo day where they present what they've been working on. And as I said, they can say, well, I tried this and this and that, and everything didn't work out. That's okay, it's a story to share and we can learn from that. So yeah, speaking about failing, you need the right kind of philosophy. Um, approaching ideas or, or, or like challenges, thinking about this has to work out, often makes things worse because then you make them work somehow, but you know it's not a good idea anymore. So if you realize that this idea wasn't a good idea, then just let it fail and tell others about it and start over again. So you can also apply again to the prototype fund with a new proposal or with the learnings you made from a first round and change, um, change your approach in that specific area. Um, and come back when about this topic to when, when I talk about the facts and figures, but diversity is value and we stress that over and over again. Um, we need diverse teams. In the beginning, we had lots of individuals who applied, or um, teams of two people, and two people means two developers. And then halfway through the fund, they came to me and said, so we have this really good software, and no one uses it, because they didn't have a UX or a UI designer, or someone who, who had a non-technical background who was looking at an app or a website and said, you know, no one who's not a coder does understand that. It's really too complicated. So for, a different, um, for, a diff for many different reasons, you need to have different people 
in your team. Someone maybe who's a designer, of course programmers, but also maybe a political scientist or a researcher or an historian. And diversity also means you need to have different, like you need to have women and men and from a different origin, but I come back when we talk about facts and figures. Um, involve your community from day one. What we also often hear is people saying, oh, it's too early to go out with my idea and talk to people. It's never too early. The more often you talk to people and present your idea, the better you get in explaining it. And the better you get in explaining it, the better it you understand yourself what you're actually doing. And you give your community who you want to use that tool you're creating an opportunity to be an active member of um, of creating that tool and that benefits you because you might not develop something that no one needs and wants and it benefits your community because then they get something they can actually make use of. So key facts and figures. Um, this is just for the very first round. We had uh, almost 500 applications and um, we realized that when you just go out there and say, okay, we have money, we hand it out. All those people who are always everywhere, they will come to you and they will apply. And that means 437 men and 32 women. And that was bad. So we started to do something else for the next rounds. We gave each round a topic. So one of the topics we gave our application round was diversity. And suddenly when we gave that topic, all the women came and all the people with a different background came and people of color came and people who had disabilities came and people who identify as a different gender came. And we, we realized you really need to address those people if you want to fund them. It, it's not enough to just, hey, we have money, come. You really need to tell them we want you. And then suddenly this really bad ratio, it changed and we're really happy about that. Um, we got, got a lot of um, civic tech and infrastructure applications, some security, um, and we were totally overwhelmed by 500 applications. We didn't expect that many, and then when we gave um, topics to each round, so the next one was tools for a strong civi civil society, um, they dropped to about 250 applications for each round, and that's way better uh, because we can only fund 25 projects, so it also reduces uh, frustration for those who make the effort to apply. Um, another thing we saw was that way more teams applied than we expected. So we expected to fund individuals, um, and we fund more individuals than teams, but we wanted actually, uh, like from the application we saw so many teams applied, that we needed to change um, how we communicated the prototype fund. So we then after the first, the first round we said, okay, teams are welcomed as well because it benefits the project and actually it's the reality. Most people don't work on their own, they work in a team. Um, so in the end we funded 16 projects, now we are up to 25, but that was for, for the first round. And um, yeah, we fund 19 men and four women. And if you look at the first, ratio then it's it's a little it's a little better for the actual projects that got funding um, so now it's almost one and a half years later there's one project that's closed so no one is working on that anymore uh, but again it's on github so be people can use the code and and continue working on that project if they want to um, 11 projects are still up and running and uh, they're mostly up and running because of voluntary work and follow-up funding. So what we see is that most people who apply for our grant, they're really focused on, on helping a community, doing something good. Most of them don't have a business model. Um, and as I said, that's okay, but we also need to think about, is it really sustainable if a project is always dependent on voluntary work and maybe funding? I think yes, but it also makes it harder for some projects to survive on the long term. So we don't only hand out money, there's a variety of things that come with that money. And we asked our projects from the first round, what do you feel was the added value of being a prototype fund project? 
And most of them said it's the network, because you meet people who can work together, who inspire you, and you, who can help you out when you don't know what to do. And we already saw that um, some of the projects we fund in different rounds now do projects together, which we really like, because that's the kind of thing we want to stimulate as well. And it's more than money. It's really important to give people uh, coachings. So most of them who apply are developers. Uh, so we give a lot of UX, UI coaching because it helps them um, to think about those uh, aspects quite early in the, in the process of um, developing a tool. And we also give coachings for uh, program management and for communication because some people have difficulties going out there and telling them, uh, telling people what they actually work on. And they said they gathered a lot of skills about being self-employed and working in, like, having your own time management, um, and that really helped them. They also got better in, um, yeah, image, like going out there and, and really presenting something in independence um, because they've been self-employed. And in recognition, so the, pr the project they worked on was recognized way more after the prototype fund. And also some people of them never developed open source software before. And because this is a requirement for the pro prototype fund, they started doing that, they really liked it, and they learned more about how to work in an open source software uh, environment. So we are about halfway through now with uh, the prototype fund and we're far from done perfect. But um, this, is, this isn't even like what we're aiming at. We are aiming at learning. Um, it doesn't need to be perfect. There needs to be a story we can tell so other people can pick it up and draw conclusions and do it better than we did it. Uh, so we hope to see many more prototypes fun prototype funds um, popping up all around the world. And if you want to learn more, if you have questions, if you have a different, um, different idea or similar idea, then just approach me or anyone from my team. You can always email us or Twitter at us. And um, thank you for listening to me. Do we have time for questions? No. Um, no, we have questions in the end. Oh, okay. That's why we have the slide on yeah. R812. So you can also write your questions for others there.